Welcome to Tell Me Your Story, New Paradigms for a New World. We are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true. And we are here Sundays at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m., Monday mornings at 1 a.m. and 9 a.m. on, on the Wednesdays for our special edition of Tell Me Your Story. I'll give you all the other great stuff in a little bit. Uh, we are flesh and blood, and uh, our guest today is going to talk a little bit uh, about that. Sort of, kind of. When you think about the title of his book, uh, you kind of think about flesh and blood. And will yours stay connected and together as flesh and blood? Because if you go chasing the bear in the wilderness, not the best advice, but it is from our guest, Rick Keller. Uh, it's uh, Little Things to Achieve Big Dreams. The book Chase the Bear is the title. And uh, Rick, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. I'm well, glad to be with you, Richard. Looking forward to it. This is uh, a, an interesting title, certainly catchy. It does get people's attention. There's no question about it. Uh, and in this case, uh, we're going to define both what it means to chase, and in this case, what or who the bear is. Uh, and obviously, when we talk about, uh, on this program, giving people choices and knowledge of those choices to help make their dreams come true, that's that's kind of where we're coming from is is we want people's dreams to come true we want to help them to achieve their goals and dreams and aspirations live out their life's purpose um, what part of the country are you in and I, I I ask this question because of the a metaphor of the bear so I'm in Orlando, just outside of uh, Disney World. No bears in Florida that I know of. Yeah, no, we have a ton of black bears, actually. Oh, it's, uh, yeah. Well, I stand the, corrected. <laughs> yeah, no grizzly bears or, or, or anything, just black bears, which if you got to have bears, they're the, they're the least aggressive of the, of the different breeds. Ah. So have you had firsthand experience with a real bear? I have had multiple firsthand experiences from a real bear, and this um, this title comes from one of those experiences. Uh, I was um, sitting there having coffee and reading the paper with my wife one Sunday morning, and outside of our window was a family of bears, uh, four bears, a mama bear and three little cubs that were running by our, our window and outside the kitchen window. And I'd never seen that before because we live a mile or two from the woods. And so without thinking, Lori, my wife and I just got up and didn't say a word and went out and started chasing these bears. We wanted to continue this magnificent experience in these little cubs run. And we never caught up with them. But afterwards, I said to Lori, you know, a black bear can run about 35 miles an hour and an Olympic sprinter only 28. I said, Lori, that's kind of nuts. You know, that bear would have turned around and felt threatened by cubs and came after us, mama bear could have got us. But then I thought about it and I said, you know, in some ways it's, it's a metaphor in life because most people in that circumstance would be content to stay inside and play it safe and look out their window as life passes them by and eventually the clock runs out. And some people will take a risk. They'll chase their dreams and they'll chase the bears. And Lori said, gosh, Rick, I think that's the name of your book. And so that's how we came up with that title. So this book, the title of the book, it was created before you had started writing it? Or no, I'm, I'm midway through the book, oh. and I knew, I knew my message. I knew the subtitle. I didn't have the title yet. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, I, I know that uh, things come about when they're supposed to, and, and we, we are all given signs. I am one of those people that trusts the universe to... To guide, uh, we talk about uh, people engaging in what we call is that uh, still small voice, listening to that still small voice going within, and situations where we are facing literal real bears or otherwise. Um, you know, it's we get caught up in our emotions, don't we? I mean, that's that's almost sometimes what the first thing is is usually it's it's fear. Um, you had a reaction similar to me. We had a brown bear on the property where we live. I walked up, I was taking care of some business and I walked up to throw something away past the, to the garbage bins. And this bear stood up, 
looking over this hedge because it was eating the loquats and the pears are on the uh, other fruits off of the trees looked at me I looked at him I walked past him and I was probably 10 to 20 feet from him took care of my business at the garbage bin walked back down the hill and my wife she just says what's going on because you know, I hadn't, <laughs> hadn't said anything oh, I just saw a bear <gasps> saw a bear I want to see the bear I want to see the bear. I'm thinking are you kidding me okay I'm taking care of something down here at the chicken coop got that done we walked up the hill and we stopped a fair distance away from him he stood up again only this time and I I say this was out of this was out of annoyance he uh, he, <laughs> he turned around he walked across the uh, road on the property out to uh, it's called stagecoach and it's a paved road the, the road that we use to get in and out and left <laughs> out of out of annoyance like Look, I was trying to eat my dinner. You are interrupting me, so I'm out of here. That's funny. But there was no fear in either of us, in either my wife or I, because we weren't trying to interfere with his life and livelihood, if you will. When we start talking about the, the, uh, metaphorical bears yeah in our lives um is is fear the number one reason why people's dreams don't come true i think it's a huge part of it i think everybody has a gift something that comes incredibly easy for them that's hard for other people that they're very good at and i think what they should be doing is using that gift as their mission to help other people, make other people's lives better. And what holds them back is fear. They're worried, well, what if my heart gets broken? What if I get rejected? What if I fail? What if people laugh at me? And I get that it's scary out there. Um, you know, I have been humiliated. I've been beaten. I've been shot at. And that's just from my wife after the last boys week in a way. So I know it's, I know it's crazy out there, but the, the key thing I think for fear is two things. Number, number one, I talk about my book is set your goal in an area that's with an area of your gifts, the, the things that you do the absolute best with the least amount of effort. And the second thing, I'm not talking about taking crazy chances. I'm talking about educated baby step risk, little steps that are aligned with your purpose. And if you do those two things, I think it will go a long way toward alleviating your fear. And if you are using your gifts for the greater good, you may stumble, but you're not going to fail on a permanent basis. You know, and that's one of the things that I know a lot of people, they, they don't understand. Number one, it, everything's temporary. It's, it, you know, this is a temporal world. Nothing lasts forever. Uh, our, our manufacturing industry tends to uh, want to increase that uh, temporalness <laughs> to cause us to buy more. But that aside, uh, even without that, everything is temporal, including situations. Nothing lasts forever because even if it goes on until your death, when you die, guess what? It's over. Uh, I've 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 used this, and I, I say this tongue in cheek. I don't mean this, but I have a solution to everyone's problem, okay? And this solution, it's foolproof. And when it's over, no one will have any problems. Every single member of the nuclear family sets off their bombs, and wipes out the species. Guess what? No more problems course you know I don't know that anybody really wants to do that I really don't but I often say look at least I offered a solution I at least I put something out there what have you got yeah so I think yeah, I oh, go ahead. what have you got <laughs> well I I think it's important to, to think about this issue of setbacks because as long as you are using your gifts and you're heading in the right directions, I think we give too much 
credence to critics. You know, there's the old saying, don't accept criticism from someone you wouldn't take advice from. And if you look at where you are in California, where I am in Orlando, a good example is is Walt Disney. And he was fired from his job at age 22 for not being creative enough. And then years later, he has this idea for a Mickey Mouse theme park. And the first 300 bankers said, no, it's a nutty idea. And of course, we know how that ended up. And Martin Luther King Jr. was given a C in public speaking. And of course, he gave the I Have a Dream speech. And Michael Jordan cut from his high school basketball team. And Oprah was told that uh, she was has to be demoted because she didn't have what it takes to make it in TV news. And the Beatles was told they didn't have what it takes to make it in the record business. And, and my favorite of all time of, of a person ignoring their critics is a 29-year-old single mom who was on welfare and she wanted to write a book and she wrote this book that she thought would be a good idea and took it to the publisher, rejected, next publisher, rejected, next publisher, rejected, 12 in a row. And the 13th publisher said yes. And the name of that book is Harry Potter. And her name is J.K. Rowling. And she's she's a billionaire now. But the common denominator with each of those people is they were all using their gifts they all stumbled. They all had people said, they're, you're not going to be able to do it, but they kept going and, and it ended well. Do you think that these people who said uh, you ain't going to make it, d that what they really meant was, I'm going to tell you you ain't going to make it because you really can. I see potential in you, but I'm not going to give you the positive reinforcement. Or do you think they were serious? No, you're not going to make it. I don't know with the, with each particular one. I know that the critics in each case were wrong, but I, I have been told in life that uh, I didn't have what it takes. Um, I can tell you, for example, uh, when I was in high school, I was fired from Wendy's and the manager said, uh, you don't have what it takes to make it in fast food. I was flipping the patties too slow, apparently. I didn't really let it rock my world. I don't think she was being malicious. I think maybe that was her opinion at the time. And so what do you do when you're not good enough uh, to even do the fast food business? And I had no choice. I just decided to run for the United States Congress, you know, and that's how I ended up. And I ended up years later in the Oval Office and I'm there with President Bush and Ted Kennedy and for a signing ceremony for my bill. And I thought about Wendy's and I thought, gosh, I'm not, I'm not good enough. Well, I'm in the Oval Office now. OK. And it worked out uh, just fine. And one of the. Uh, people who saw me in the Oval Office, the picture was in the paper, sent me a letter and said, um, you think you can serve our country? You can't even serve French fries. And I wrote back and said, shut up, mom, shut up. Yeah, she, <laughs> she was my designated person to keep me humble and modest. But I didn't take it. Uh, I, I took it with a grain of salt because I, I knew I had skills and I knew I could be persistent. And I think the same thing with those people. Now, if I had tried to do something outside of my gifts, uh, I think it would be a problem. I think if Albert Einstein, instead of being a physicist, decided he wanted to be a professional bull rider, I th think it would have been a problem. So, so the big thing I'm pushing in my book is I want to encourage people to do what's easy, do the thing that comes easy for them, the thing that comes natural, that they're really good at, the thing that they would do for free. The thing that you would, when you start doing it, you feel like you're about a six and after about an hour, you feel like a 10 and time flies. Whatever that thing is for you, do, do that thing. We are talking with uh, Rick Keller, the author of Chase the Bears, plural, Chase the Bears. And uh, we want to talk more about uh, the little things to achieve big dreams here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and it's a pleasure to have uh, Rick with us here on the program to talk about the work that he is doing. Uh, we also encourage you to uh, listen to the podcasts, which are on uh, SoundCloud, iTunes, TuneIn Radio, Spotify, Stitcher, Player FM, Blueberry, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and many other locations across the Internet. We also uh, are here on YouTube, where you can listen to and watch these videos. Uh, of course, the channels, Richard Dugan and Tell Me Your Story. Uh, you'll be able to easily find us, if you will. And uh, it's kind of funny uh, when I think about uh, some of what you're saying. I was uh, watching a, a video just yesterday as of our conversation uh, where uh, someone was saying, 
uh, basically that um, failure, for example, is essential. In other words, uh, you need to fail. Now, I don't care for the word fail, let alone the word mistakes. I prefer to use the term learning experience or life lessons. Uh, and I've used this example and I, will, I know that a lot of people have used this example um, to describe this concept and that's for example uh, Edison who developed uh, the, the light bulb. And um, at, he was asked the question, you know, how many times did you fail before you uh, got the light bulb uh, got the light bulb right? And he said, well, I never failed. Not once. Because I just found 990 ways that the light bulb didn't work. Um, terminology aside, Rick, let me ask you about, uh, about that aspect of the necessity for, we'll call it failure, or making mistakes. And I know we hear parents say this all the time, look, I, I don't want you to make the same mistakes I made. Nice sentiment. However, do you really think that that's that helpful? Protective, yes. Rightfully so as a parent, but helpful? I, I agree with your sentiment. I think that you are either succeeding or you're learning, but either way, you're winning. And most people, when they look back on their life and they see these little setbacks, they often realize that it's the best thing that, that ever happened to them. It was the universe steering them back onto their true path. And one of my favorite stories along this regard is, is, is out of California and Lisa Kudrow from Friends. And she came out to uh, L.A. and wanted, wanted to be an actress. And she was so excited. She got on this uh, program called The Groundlings, you know, this improv group in L.A. And she tried out for Saturday Night Live and didn't get accepted. And then uh, she wanted to be on the show Frasier and she got that part. She's so excited and she got let go af after two days. And she thought, man, this is horrible. And, and her agents were telling her she wasn't pretty enough, wasn't talented enough. And then one day she was doing a bit part for this show, Mad About You. And she met a contact there and he said, you know, I got this new show that I'm trying to do a pilot for about these 620 somethings who hang out in a coffee shop called friends and why don't you try out for that and she got it and next thing you know 10 years later she's a big star and she won an emmy award and she looked back on her life and she's like oh my goodness thank god i didn't get saturday night live thank god i got uh didn't get fraser i i would never have been on friends and it turned out in retrospect to be the best thing that ever happened to them and i think many of us when you look back on your life you'll you'll see the same thing We are, we are talking with Rick Keller. He's the author of Chase the Bear, uh, Little Things to Achieve Big Dreams. I have often said, Rick, that it is the details that will make you or break you. And it sounds like you're kind of saying the same thing here, that you need to take care of the little things, the details. Uh, and because that's how things are are built, right? Yeah, I think there are little things that you can do that may may seem like little things, but in reality, they're big things. And it was interesting. There was a, a famous speech called the Make Your Bed speech um, by uh, an admiral who who talked about one of the first things you should do in the morning is, is, is make your bed and it gets the day off to a good start. And it's just a little thing, but it's a, it's a positive habit. In my book, I talk about these little things that that seem like little things, but in reality, they're, they're big things. Using your gifts, trusting your intuition, taking some baby step risk, uh, risking failure, and not taking yourself too seriously. And, and if you do those little things, it's my view that you can fly as high as you want to fly for the long as you want to fly. And what makes my book a little bit different is that instead of just telling you inspirational stories, which I do, 
it shows you how to do it. It gives you a step-by-step -step formula that you can use to convert your thoughts and dreams into reality. And I know it works because it's what I used. I was a mediocre student, came from a poor family. I used these techniques to set a goal of graduating number one in my class in college, and it happened. I set this goal to uh, get elected to the United States Congress, and that happened. And as I got older, I no longer really have the desire to get more trophies for myself. What really gives me joy is helping others get the trophies. And so that's why I wrote this book. I wanted to really make a, a difference in people's lives and give them some specific tools that they can use so that the details in their life come out okay. You know, you've been a member of Congress, uh, and we're just going to touch on this for just a couple of moments. Uh, sure. We're not going to go in depth because this program isn't about politics. Yeah. Uh, but one of the things that has frustrated myself and many other people, I wish that those people whose frustrations were high would use more productive methods of expressing that than some that have, uh, that, than the way they have. But it seems to me, and this is an observation, that, uh, what is it? 400 and is it 35 in the house? Yeah. Yep. 435 in the house and 100 in the Senate don't care about the common man, don't care about me, do not care about we the people. They only care about the power, the control, and getting reelected. And that is not, uh, and I, you hear this phrase all the time, that's not what the Founding Fathers intended. Uh, I don't necessarily agree with term limits because that's, to me, that's where the voter comes in. But it, by the same token, when you hear that a, a, a congressman has been in for 22 uh, uh, terms uh, or something like this, I mean, Strom Thurmond, are you serious? Please, this is ridiculous. Uh, you know, you're not supposed to die in office. Um, it seems as though we're at, 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 at sort of a, a turning point, a threshold, a, I don't know what you want to call it, and that there are, this is, this is the time in our history, if you will, as we make it, where we have to start reevaluating the choices that we have made. The, 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 there are those who do not want to participate in the system anymore uh, because of what's happening. They say, what's the point? Nothing's changed. It's gotten worse. I've participated for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, and it's only gotten worse. So if I don't participate, it's going to get worse whether I participate or not. It might get better by my not participating. And then we have people who undermine people's participation by saying, uh, it's rigged, uh, there's cheating going on, uh, and then you get all of these different party uh, uh, affiliates who do the research, they do the investigation, say, no, there, there's no, there's no cheating going on, it's not rigged, you know, yeah, we had one or two instances in this state, or one or two in this state, so as a member of a community we call America and Americans, what do we do? I mean, you know, there are those again, they've thrown up their hands and said enough, I'm going to get off the grid, bye bye federal government, you've taken enough of my money and my time and my energy, I'm not going to focus on you anymore. And you have been in those halls. I think the number one problem facing our country right now now above all others is the erosion of civility we have divisive politicians and twitter trolls and screaming talking heads and it's different than it used to be uh it, it used to be that you and i there may be 10 issues and and we agree on seven and three of them we agree to disagree and nowadays if you don't agree on all of them you're you're the enemy and you're worthless and you're you're treated disrespectfully and i think we've got to do three things First, I think we've got to listen with an open mind, truly listen to what the other person has to say. Number two, you don't have to agree on everything or anything. Just act respectfully. And number three, I think you have to put relationships above differences and focuses, focus on those things that you have in common because 
what I've learned in politics is that the a person who is your opponent today, next week, may be your greatest ally. And I'll give you an example. So I happen to be Republican, but I focus the majority of my energy in Congress on what people perceive to be a Democrat issue, which is Pell Grants, helping poor kids go to college. And I was the chairman of the Higher Education Subcommittee. We increased Pell Grants uh, 62%, so an extra five and a half million people would go. But I wouldn't get mad at a Democrat who voted against my tax reduction bill because the next week that guy is going to be my number one champion in terms of Pell Grants. And I think we need people to to realize that and, and start putting civility where, where it belongs. And that would do a lot to heal the way people think about it. I can tell you this, you can really make a positive difference. I, I went to Congress just because I wanted to help poor kids go to college. I was on a mission. But what I learned from being there is that you you can pick up the phone and, and change someone's life in such a positive way. I'll give you one example. A young female attorney come, came up to me after I gave a speech to her woman's lawyers group and says, hey, Congressman, I need your help. My mom is in a prison in Vietnam. And I said, what happened? And she told me the story. She went over there for a cousin's uh, wedding and she was arrested and put in jail for a year because she had given an interview saying you should have elections in Vietnam. And it sounded crazy. And so I found out about it and I learned that we have some leverage. There was a bill that was important to Vietnam that was coming through Congress. And I stopped it in the Senate. And one of my colleagues, Mel Martinez, stopped it. I stopped it in the House and he stopped it in the Senate. And I called the head head ambassador at Vietnam and said, you better let her go, buddy, because this is a $10 billion bill and um, it's not moving. And they let her out of prison. And we were able to celebrate her with her uh, just before Thanksgiving when she got back. And every year, every November, I get a ding on my cell phone and it's her daughter saying, uh, thank you. This is the day that you saved my mom's life. So I really didn't change the world, but I did make a difference in, in one person's life, at least. Well, and that's what uh, that's how it starts. You know, you, you you change the you change one person's life and then it has that ripple effect, as as we often like to talk about. We're talking with Rick Keller. He is the author of Chase the Bears. It is uh, little things to achieve big dreams as we continue here on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host with Rick Keller, and we are talking about uh, some of the aspects of life on the outer outside world. And I'm wondering, uh, Rick, uh, where you hail from philosophically. Now, not politically. That's not what we're talking about here, but philosophically, because just because you're a Republican doesn't make you right or wrong. OK, I still love the old joke Two rights. Uh, don't make a wrong, but they will get you off the freeway. Hmm. Um, and that's as, about as far as we'll go with that one. But I'm just curious, um, your, your underpinnings philosophically as you were a kid growing up. So my philosophical thing is I want to help lift people up and I want to bring them together. And I'm not married to whether that means I'm Republican or Democrat or Libertarian. The, the older I get, I have to tell you, the more Libertarian I, I, I become. But it's it's really lifting people up and bringing them together is, is where I come from. And I, I was raised by a single mom uh, in a one-bedroom home, three kids with my, with my grandmother, didn't have a lot of money. But something happened to me that was kind of an emotional turning point that that shaped my whole philosophy. And it was essentially this. I didn't have enough money to go to college. And my mom was a secretary and said, why don't you ask Mr. Overstreet? He was the president of Overstreet Investment Company if his company would make a charitable contribution to you because she types his checks for charitable, charitable contributions, to a lot of other charities. And I went and met with him. I was 17 and he was 81 and I made my pitch. I want to go to college so bad and you're not going to be wasting money. And I promise I'll graduate top of my class if you just give me a chance. And he said, son, I'm just the president of this company. I got a board of directors I have to answer to and come back Tuesday afternoon. We're meeting Tuesday morning. And I went back Tuesday afternoon. I couldn't sleep the night before. And he said, the answer is I, we, we met with the board and the board decided that they will not help you go to college. And it's nothing personal. But if they did that for you, they'd have to do that for every other employee. And my intuition just said, be grateful that he even tried. And so I, I said, thank you, Mr. Overseer, for just trying. And then uncontrollably, 
tears just started coming down my face because it hit me at that moment that I'm not going to be going to college. And he said, son, you can, you can wipe the tears away. I said, the company couldn't put you through college. I didn't say that I couldn't. And with that, he stroked the check and sent me to college. And four years later, I was the valedictorian. And 20 years later, that seed of kindness that he planted uh, blossomed. And I was able to help five and a half million people go to college. And five and a half million people were affected just really by one act of kindness, by one man who never did a press release. Nobody knew the story, but it shaped me. And I was like, gosh, I... I want to be like that. I want to pay it forward and lift people up. And it gives me a lot more satisfaction doing that than it would be, say, becoming Bill Gates and being a billionaire or something. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but I just not my desire. Yeah. And and I'm sure you're familiar with uh, uh, the uh, uh, the video, the, the movie, The Secret. Yeah. And uh, I was interviewing someone and we were we were talking a little bit about it. It wasn't a, an interview about The Secret, but it came up, The Law of Attraction. And they said they left something out. They left something out. It wasn't intentional. I don't think they left it out intentionally. I, but but they missed something that is very important. And I ha this has stuck with me ever since. And it kind of goes to to uh, your life and and where you have where you have uh, come from and and where you are now. Uh, I said that um, just because you want it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a in your best interest for your highest good or for uh, or part of your life's purpose for example you uh you know and i don't know uh, you know everything about you i haven't i haven't done a google search <laughs> on anything about you other than the book that i have here chase the bears but i don't know that a yacht uh, uh, you know a hundred foot yacht is necessarily in your best interest you might want one you know, it'd be kind of fun to have maybe, but then of course there's all the ancillary responsibilities tied to that too. Um, I don't really want my own jet to fly from this place to that. Uh, I kind of like the two feet that the good Lord gave me to walk from one place to the other. I got a bicycle. I do have a truck. There's public transportation. There are friends that I can get from this place to that. So I'm happy. Uh, I don't have uh, multiple numbers. Uh, to the left of the decimal point in my bank account, but I'm happy. Talk to us about that aspect in the preamble that talks about the inalienable rights of uh, the pursuit of happiness. Happy to, and I think the key theme that I want to get across in terms of this happiness pursuit is the word easiness, easiness. So for three things, number one, I think you need to be doing the job using your gifts of the thing that comes easy to you. That's what you're supposed to be doing. You were given that gift at birth. Do the thing that comes easy for you, that you're good at, that, that you love. Number two, I think that applies to personal relationships as well. You hear people say, well, marriage is hard. It's just tough. And it, it shouldn't be that damn hard. It, when you're with the right person, it should be paddling downstream and, and you may hit some rapids here and there, but it, it shouldn't be that hard when, when you're with the right person. And third, in terms of what you do with your free time, I, I think you should be doing the easy things that give you joy. Like in my particular case, I love going to comedy clubs. I love riding my Ducati motorcycle. I like going to college football games. And I could make a hell of a lot more money if I said, well, I'm going to bill 80 hours this week as a lawyer rather than doing that. But those things give me joy. And the combination of doing what I love and being with someone that I'm in love with and I'm doing what I want gives me far more joy than, than it would be chasing another extra $100,000 a year. I think that's one of the things, too, that people are getting caught up in uh, is, is the accumulation of things the accumulation of wealth uh, and, and, and those aspects. Uh, and, and certainly uh, this country isn't uh, functioning in the way that, uh, say, it may have 100 or 200 years ago. Uh, and, and that's because there is this process of, of evolution, although there would be those who would argue, no, actually it's devolution. You know, because we've you feels a little bit like maybe we've gone backwards. 
that kind of thing. What about your perspective on this country, but also we, we are, uh, well, I, I, maybe I should put it in the form of a question. Do you think that we live in a global community? Well, I think in terms of the happiness equation, the best way I've ever heard it said, there's a guy named Arthur C. Brooks, who's a Harvard professor. He wrote this number one New York Times bestseller called From Strength to Strength. And he essentially says this way, we're supposed to love people and use things. But what most people do is the opposite. They use people and they love things. They love the boat. They love this. They love that. And that's not what's going to bring you joy. And I think it's it's important when you ultimately decide, you know what, the whole world isn't about me. I'm, I'm one of 7.6 billion. And if I can help make other people's lives better with my gift, whether that's entertaining them, healing them, simplifying their life, that is what's going to give you so much joy. That's what's going to lift you up and make, feel, make you feel good about yourself. And you don't have to delay doing that. You can take whatever your gift is and do it every single day and use that gift. And you're, you're going to head in the direction of your dreams. You're going to be a lot happier. Well, I know that uh, one of the things that, that I have um, talked about on this program quite prevalently is the aspect of trying to be the best person you can be. And we've had a lot of examples in, mod in recent years, uh, and I'll even throw out the last decade, because I will tell you, I did not care for Ronald Reagan's pro policies regarding the FCC and broadcasting, both in early 80 when he was elected uh, and he deregulated uh, the FCC and got rid of the third class license, which I spent so long in broadcast school studying for and I wanted that, I wanted that thing, okay. And then he got rid of the Fairness Doctrine in 87. But I'll tell you what, I would have sat down and had a chat with him over a beer. I wouldn't have had a problem with that at all. But the people that are out there today, I wouldn't want to get close, any closer than a 10-foot pole because they're so toxic. Uh, their attitudes, their mindset is, and I'm not saying they're wrong in their attitudes or mindset. I'm just saying I don't want that in my life. I'm an optimistic guy. I jokingly say that my glass is half full. I'm just not sure what it's full of. <laughs> <laughs> and some, some might, might answer that question for me. But uh, what about you? I mean, when, when did you leave uh, um, uh, uh, public life in that respect as a, as a congressman? So I was there during the same years as George W. Bush, so 2000 through 2008. Uh, I would describe myself as an optimist. I can tell you that. I, I don't hang around with anybody that's negative, and I don't care if you're related to me. I don't care if you went to high school with me. If you're negative and, and it's draining my energy and it's making me sad, I don't, I don't hang around that. I, I just don't have the time. I think it all comes down to energy. And and my view is the way I can make the world better is lift people up and give them energy, not not take away their energy. And so if there's anybody who's toxic, that's narcissistic, who's draining my energy, I just I won't be around them. I just just won't do it. I think life's short, man. And I had to learn that lesson um, firsthand because it used to be when I got involved in politics, I walk into a room, and there's a hundred people there. And 98 like me and two of them hate me. I can feel it. I can feel the energy. And I would spend the whole two hours trying to win over those two people. And I finally realized what a waste of time. What a waste of time. I I'll be courteous to them, but I'm not going to let them drain my energy at the expense of all those other people. I'm going to hang around the people who are positive and, and invest my time with them, the people that care about me. We, we look for, uh, we talk, you know, kind of part of our slogan is new paradigms for a new world. So we're looking for those new ways of living because all you have to do is look, Rick, you and I, we can just look around. The old ways just don't work anymore. They just don't. And what really frustrated me in 2008, uh, and I realize we're kind of talking more about the material world in that respect, but that's fine. They said we'd never been down this road before, which I thought was a fascinating phrase to use. But okay, we've never been down this road before, which tells me we have to come up with some different solutions to, to, to meet this challenge. 
Einstein said it best. The consciousness that created the challenge or problem cannot be the same consciousness that meets it or solves it. Okay? And yet they said, we've never been here before. But what do they do? They use the same solutions that they'd been using for decades during economic downturns or problems. Now, I have a real problem with economists because I like what Will Rogers said. You can lay, you can lay 100 economists end to end, they'll all still all point in different directions. But I ask economists this question, and I, I put it out there in general. What numbers would make you happy? Okay, because we'd like to have you happy too. Because when the numbers are up, you're still not happy. When the numbers are down, we understand why you're not happy. So what numbers would make you happy? And we'll see what we can do. Um, when the pandemic was declared by the World Health Organization and the United States decided to do something about it, in my lifetime, because I wasn't around in the 19-teens, they decided to do something they had never done before. And I applauded. Not because I agreed with the decision, but because they decided to do something different. Which meant that when we came out the other side, and I'm not sure we're out, of the, other, out the other side yet, maybe we are, it's going to be different than all the other times when we did nothing. In spite of the fact that we have vaccines for influenza and so forth, I've often said, uh, Rick, with the influenza, shut the air when it starts to, to manifest in the United States, shut the airlines down for two weeks. Just two weeks. Stop people from moving around in these petri tubes and, and so on and so forth and spreading this thing. And we'll get rid of it in two weeks. It'll be over. Because I have to wonder if there have been studies done, uh, Rick. Uh, on the loss of productivity by people who go to work sick, who infect other people who then are sick, and, you know, the domino effect. So when, when the government decided to do something different, I, I said, I applauded, and I said, and we don't even know what other new opportunities are coming. I mean, you probably know as well as I do, maybe in your own neighborhood, there were people who actually flourished, not necessarily financially, but they flourished because they stepped up and they decided to help. They decided to pitch in and say, what can I do to minimize the stress and the suffering uh, of the community? Even if you don't have COVID, you're still you know, suffering because we're all in our homes. By the way, they said, go home. They didn't say you had to stay inside. And that was one of the things that I thought was so funny. It's like, you can walk out in your front lawn if you have one or in your backyard. Uh, but what about that when, when in our society we're so s set on certain rules and certain ways of doing things and it's like we're never going to change anything unless we make new decisions, different choices. Well, I think it's so important to trust your in intuition no matter how unconventional or unpopular it seems. You know, Malcolm Gladwell wrote this book at, at, about David versus Goliath, and they looked at wars over 200 years, and, and, and Goliath wins 70% of the time. But when David uses an unconventional tactic, just like David in David versus Goliath used a slingshot, David wins two out of three times. And sometimes the unconventional way is the way to go, and it may, may be something new that hasn't been tried before. My uh, entry into politics was incredibly unconventional. I, I used my sense of humor to, to leapfrog um, above everyone else. And, and it wasn't a conventional path. I'll give you an example. When I ran, I was losing by 27 points in the polls. I'll fundraise four to one. The leader of my own party asked me to drop out. And I was invited to D.C. to give this speech that was five minutes. It was like um, American Idol for politicians to a group of economists and CEOs. They were putting some big money to a handful of races. And there were 16 of us. And I was the last one. And the first 15 people were all serious. And they were talking about Laffer curves and capital gains, tax reductions, and this and that. And I just decided to be myself. I'd been waiting for hours and I was frustrated. And I said, guys, I've been here for three hours. 
I feel like Elizabeth Taylor's seventh husband on his honeymoon <laughs> night. I know what I'm supposed to do, but I don't know how to make it interesting. And that one little line um, changed my life. They group ranked me number one in the country. They spent 400000 to support me. And a few months later, I shocked the country and won, won a seat in the United States Congress, despite being an underdog. But it was unconventional. That group hadn't even existed before. Uh, there was there was no typical path that I took. I just did what was natural and authentic and and trusted my intuition. And I think that's what people need to do. Your your inner voice that you started the show talking about, that still small voice is, is better than anyone else's advice. The, the way I see it is when you when you have a prayer, it's like by analogy, it's like sending a text to God. And I think intuition is God writing back that that's listening to uh, to the universe or God or whatever you call this creative life force. And I think that's so incredibly important. And if you're authentic and listening to your inner voice, don't be afraid to take that unconventional path. It may be exactly what you need to get ahead. Let me ask you, uh, in, in regards to these kinds of things, there are people who they will uh, dis they will use the phrase that uh, this country was founded on Judeo Christian principles. Uh, I believe the founding fathers, most of them, were deists. They weren't necessarily Christians, and they also were not. Um, they were not people who. Um, when they said uh, that the, the that the Congress or the government shall uh, shall establish no state religion, if you will, I'll paraphrase the First Amendment. Uh, now, yes, there's this big grappling, but I hear it more amongst the uh, amongst the faithful. Uh, that uh, and bear in mind, I worked for 15 years for a Christian radio station, so I have a pretty good indication of where a lot of these folks are coming from, and I'm not disparaging any of them. They have the right to their perspective. But when we had this big, uh, a big brouhaha over the Muslim faith and over uh, Muslims uh, uh, running for and winning offices in different parts of our country, the big fear that they, I, I started hearing was, oh my God, they're going to institute Sharia law, which basically means they're going to institute laws based upon, say, the Quran. And I'm sitting here thinking, okay, let's see, uh, what do we have instituted right now in our own country and the laws across this land? And some will say that many of the laws are based upon Christian principles. Well, what's the difference between Christian Sharia law and Muslim Sharia law. It's still Sharia law. You're still, you're still playing that same silly game of trying to control people. Um, do you think that, that, the, the, that intuition that we are talking about is the better guide for us in terms of a formulating ways in which we should we should participate in our society in a civil and and going back to some of the things you said respectful and even i have i'll even add this one to it and honorable way because right now th there's a part of me that says you know what i don't want to be an american anymore i'm ashamed to be an american because of how uh, uh how our country is being represented by the loudmouths the minorities yeah, I I would start with from a 30,000 foot perspective just the golden rule and I I think that's the that's the dominant thing the, the golden rule and from there um inclusiveness and there's there's room for everybody. Uh I can tell very quickly a lot about someone's character not by their particular religion whether they're agnostic, Jewish, Christian I can tell a lot about their character in less than a minute by how they treat people with less power. And if a person is an a-hole to the waiter at Bennigan's, they're, they're probably an a-hole. 
you know, and, and if you're nice to the janitor when no one's looking, you're probably a pretty good person. And so that's what I look for is, is empathy and kindness. And if my children had empathy and kindness, I really could care less about what particular sect of religion that they use. I don't think that the Baptist gets into heaven by excluding the Methodist and, and vice versa. I, I think there's room for everybody. Well, that was what really hurt me when I was working for that Christian station. And this was in the early 80s at the outbreak and the onset of AIDS and the things that were said by prominent ministers and pastors. And every time I would hear about uh, certain groups of people who would not be allowed in the church, quote unquote church, pardon me for the air quotes, <laughs> I'm going, wait a minute, but that's what the church is for. It's for the sinners. It's for the people who have fallen. How can you not let them in? Um, and, and, and I thought, wow. And, you know, you, you talked about, you used the word inclusion. There's another word that people like to use, and I don't like using it. Because there's judgment tied to it. And that's the word tolerance. You know what, Rick? Your philosophy, your political persuasion, I don't tolerate it. And I don't tolerate you. I accept you. I may not agree with you on everything. Just like you said. Uh, we probably agree on 7 of 10. But I accept you because A, you're a member of the human race. And guess what? So am I. All right. Then you're also an American. So am I. And no, I'm not checking your papers. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we have a kinship because we're both males. Uh, and I'll, I won't go any further than that, but you see my point. Yeah, absolutely. I, that's when I talked about the erosion of civility, one of the first things I, I said, and I really believe it is listen with an open mind. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When I was elected to Congress, there's an orientation at Harvard and that they send you to for a week. And I went up there and in the past, it was real controversial because Republicans wouldn't go up there because they thought Harvard was left leaning and then some some liberal Democrats were upset because they had too many CEOs and not enough labor union leaders. And it it mystified me because w would it kill a liberal Democrat to listen to a right leaning CEO about how to create more jobs in the private sector? Would it would it kill a Republican to listen to what a left leaning Harvard professor says about how to help poor kids get greater access to college. Just keep an open mind. I mean, for God's sakes, there are things that I believe wholeheartedly in my first year that by my eighth year, I didn't believe anymore. I, I had acquired new wisdom and I saw the other side, but I was open minded and, and willing to be persuaded. And I think that's what we that's what we need. Just just listen, for God's sakes, and consider the other side. And in my particular case, that little orientation saved me because there was a psychiatrist there and he said, you know, when you're in a stressful position, do the same thing every day. One thing you pick every day. And so I decided, even though I was overweight and it was not a great athlete, I was going to run for 15 minutes every morning at 6 a.m., no matter what country I was in, whether it's Alaska, Iraq, Afghanistan, whatever. And it really gave me stability and, and structure and stress release. I would not have known that had I not gone there with an open mind and listened to what some left-leaning Harvard psychiatrist said. It, I, I listened and I learned something and it made my life better when I really needed it. You know, what's really interesting is what you've just stated. I was interviewing a Christian musician named John Fisher, and he'd written this book and he'd put out a number of albums and he had moved from California where he was born and raised in what he referred to as the Jesus movement, and he moved to New England. And he said one day he was sitting in his uh, writer's garret, if you will, looking out the window in the fall at the leaves turning and falling and swirling around and so forth. And he began to question, do I believe what I believe because I believe it or be because I was told to believe it? And at that one, that is one of those seminal moments for me that said, oh my God, there's hope in this world. That means that in spite of a person's faith and belief system, they're still thinking, they're still feeling, they're still pondering, and they haven't set everything in concrete. And, and you did that yourself, just as you said, in the eight years, 
uh, from beginning to end. You were not the same person coming out the door as you were going in eight years earlier. And that, uh, and uh, forgive me for putting this way, but that's impressive that yeah. you're willing to do that. That that shows in in you and people who are around you uh, a great a great sense of growth. Uh, and if I can use the word again, evolution. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll give you a simple example for maybe people in California and Florida can really relate to, but dealing with prescription drugs. You know, when I went up there, the uh, pharmaceutical companies were in America, were saying no imports from Canada. We're the ones who have who subsidize the R and D, and it's not safe. And so. You only have a patent for 20 years and so it's okay to have these high prices and you don't want things from Canada because it's going to be unsafe and it's unfair. Eight years later, I came to the conclusion of BS, BS. There's, there's no reason somebody here has to pay $60 for a pill that you can get there for a dollar. I think there should be importation from Canada. I think it's perfectly possible to use certified pharmacies and make it um, healthy for everybody and, and especially for seniors who can't afford it. So it was something that I flipped 100% on, but it was just keeping an open mind and studying it and having hearings and, and using life experiences. But you've got to be open to that. I, you can't go in thinking that you know everything because what you believe on day one may not believe what what you even believe on, on day five. Mm -hmm. And so why, if, if you're not married to your own opinions, why, why would you ridicule someone else who happens to temporarily have a different point of view than you on something? That's a good point. It temporarily has that point of view. I uh, shared with my sister once and she was very staunch in her, her beliefs. I was, we were all born and raised Catholic, but she went off to, to do her own thing when she got married and so forth. And, and, uh, and, and what have you. And we were standing the wrong time to stand in the kitchen at my mother's house was Thanksgiving dinner cooking. Wrong time to have this conversation, but we had it anyway. And she was challenging me on my, uh, my salvation, my faith. And I said, my beliefs of yesterday are not my beliefs of today are not my beliefs of tomorrow because I'm still alive and breathing and learning and experiencing and growing. You know, how can I lock in? And I think one of my favorite phrases, this was shared with me, uh, when I was around 21 years of age, when I was working for a radio reading service for the blind, and um, I was doing interviews then, and uh, I was talking with someone, and I guess I was coming across a little self-important, and I love the universe does things to help me to keep my feet on the ground. And the phrase that this person said, they, this quote, they said, it is better to begin in doubt, or I beg your pardon, it is better to begin in doubt and end in certainty than to begin in certainty and end in doubt. And I think that regardless of what your personal faith is, I would, uh, let's just say I, I were to take on the moniker uh, officially of Christian, I would say I'm an agnostic Christian because I don't know. I may believe, but believing isn't knowing. That's why I loved listening to Larry King. Uh, I grew up listening to that man because he always said that I'm an agnostic. I don't, I, I don't know. I don't know, uh, you know. But of course, I loved him talking about baseball. That I know about. <laughs> <laughs> I have a big, I have a chapter in my book about Larry King. I was such a huge fan of his, and what one of my chapters is connecting with people. And Larry King, I think, connected better than anyone ever has. And he gave the story in a speech that he gave in Southern California, University of San Diego, that he always wanted to be in radio. That was his passion, right? And he was a, a teen and he was sweeping up the floor. And the general manager said, you know, we're going to give you a shot. We just had a, a DJ leave. And on Monday morning, his name at the time was Larry Zeiger. He said, you're going to Larry Zeiger, you're going to have your chance. And so he practices all weekend saying his name over and over and welcome to the show. And he gets in the studio and just before he went on air, the manager said, this is not a good name for you. It's too Jewish. We're going to change it to Larry King. <laughs> and so uh, he, he goes in the studio booth and he hits the play button for the theme song. And after the theme song was wind down, he went to speak in the microphone and he said, no words came out. And he's like, I just panicked and I, I was scared. And then he hit the theme song again and had to play it again. And the manager came in and yelled to him and he said, this is a communication business. Damn it. You know, communicate. <laughs> and so when the theme song ended, he said he did something that changed his life. He said, 
Uh, guys, I want to tell you what's going on. My name is Larry King. I've never said that before in my life. It's the first time. I've never been on the air before. It's what I've always dreamed of. I'm scared. Uh, I This is what happened. I really want to make this work. I really want to be good at this. So just give me a chance. It's my first day. And he said he connected with people. If you're honest with your audience and, and vulnerable and authentic and real, they'll be there with you. And he became... Talker Magazine rated him the number one TV show host of, of all times. And it was that one secret, the willing to be yourself and being vulnerable and authentic. That's what connected with him with people. And it was he was so wise. And it sounds easy, but you know what? We're programmed to do something differently. We're, we're told from a young age is put your best foot forward, fake it till you make it, never let him see you sweat. And it, the truth is exactly the opposite that you connect with people by being vulnerable and authentic and real. And nobody knew that better than Larry King. You know, and you bring up an interesting point, even in the music industry, the most successful musicians, singers, songwriters, are those who write songs and sing songs about the truths of their lives. And there are some I think of, my, one of my favorites, of course, John Denver, but more modern uh, would be uh, a woman like Adele. Yeah, she is unbelievable in in putting her heart out there on in that song, telling the truth about as she sees it. And again, it's her perspective. She has the right uh, as she sees it to to share the the struggles, the pains, the joys and so forth of being who she is. And that's I think that's the reason why she's most su so successful. It isn't just about the sound of her voice, or in John's case, the sound of his voice, or a couple of my other favorites, Harry Chapin, who is, was one of the great storytellers, in my opinion, uh, in my era, um, you know, he would do the same thing in telling these different stories. Um, but I want to ask you uh, uh, one uh, final question, and I want to remind our listeners that you are listening to Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and uh, uh, Rick Keller is my guest. I want to ask you, um, what do you think, after what you've just said about being honest, being true, about a spe specifically politicians, but not just, I don't want to pigeonhole here, okay? People in general, but more the prominent ones who may be CEOs, who may be heads of companies, and they have these foibles. I'll use the word foible, okay? I'll be kind. <laughs> and then, uh, let's just say the news media gets wind of it, and they all gather at the front porch of this guy or gal's uh, uh, home, start grilling them. Can you tell, what happened? I've got, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I, I, you know, blah, 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 blah. Instead of saying, you know what? Uh, more like Al Franken and not like Jimmy Swaggart. Hey, I did it. The intent wasn't malicious, but that's the way it was taken. And I, I will, I will, I'll give up my seat. I'll step down because I admit that I did it. And do you know his story probably lasted that 15 minutes of fame kind of thing? Whereas other other politicians, other CEOs, other prominent people, they say, no, I didn't do it. I didn't do it. And the story just goes on and on and on until eventually in the public uh, in public opinion, enough of evidence is presented where finally they're ignored because it's like you're a liar. You know, because you've got these people over here who saw you do it. We got this video that shows that you did it, and you're saying, I didn't do it. Um, what are your thoughts about that aspect of our lives? Because I look at it this way, uh, Rick. God, who is omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, knows everything. And I say, what difference do, does it make if 8 billion other people know and most of them don't care because they're too busy just surviving um, to just own up. Hey, these are my foibles. Yeah, I think people don't expect you to be perfect. They expect you to be authentic. 
And if you are authentic um, and you tell the truth, then sometimes it's very temporarily inconvenient. Um, but long term, it's always the best policy. So, for example, if I was getting ready today and I said to my wife, what do you what do you think of this shirt that I'm going to wear on on Richard's show? She would have no problems telling me I, I don't like it, Rick. You know, it's it's not your best color. And it would hurt my feelings temporarily, but it's so powerful long term because one day when she says she does like it, I know it's valid. I know it's true because the credibility you have when you're authentic with people always is the best thing over the long term. And so put the long term out there, trust people, let the chips fall where they may. And I think you can't go wrong long term. In your book, you 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 said you uh, you talk about uh, your actual encounters with bears, and you had numerous ones. Obviously, they yes, described to us uh, with you and your wife seeing this family. Uh, of yes, bears. do you live in, in in a rural part of Florida? Yeah, the outskirts of Orlando is the the biggest in Seminole County has the biggest population per person of black bears anywhere. They're, they're pretty harmless, but they're hit on the road all the time. I've had three in-person encounters with bears. Every, every single time I handled it wrong. The, the worst thing you can do is, is run. You, you can't outrun a bear, but I can tell you that that fight or flight kicks in. And I would bet all my money and my kids trust fund that if you're in that situation, you'd, you'd run too. most people if you encounter it. And, and it's the worst thing to do. The best thing to do is how, how you handled it there. But it's an amusing thing because I in writing this book, I had to listen to all these bear experts and what they said. And 90 percent of them just don't have a clue what they're talking about. Um, some of them said that you should pet the cubs and be be friends. The friend, the mom bear, so she won't think that you're, you know, you're a, you're a threat. And others say you should sit there and sing, don't stop believing and sing to the bears. But there's so much silliness out there that I, I ended the book by listing the the five tips on bear safety that were, they're kind of humorous to me that, that I got off legitimate uh, YouTube videos and, and internet articles. Well, I have to say that, you know, as I was sharing earlier, I, I had uh, my own experience that I shared uh, with a bear and I wasn't afraid. And I take it that you and your wife were in the same situation where, you know, they're they're far enough away where you don't feel threatened and neither do they because I guess they kind of walked up on you. Um, so you just kind of you took it in stride. You think that that's that's sort of the message you're trying to get across in Chase the Bears that you really just need to start taking things in stride. I use the analogy of laying back, um, laying back, floating on a river, and basically just letting the current carry you. It'll carry you to one side or the other, and you might hit a few rough waters like you talked about. You know, this is part of, part of life. But if you just let life carry you and do the things that, you know, you love doing, uh, you're going to experience a whole lot less stress and struggle and strife uh, internally than you would otherwise. I think the river is a wonderful analogy. I, I think that's how life should be. You should be going downstream in, in terms of your passion, your occupation, your personal relationships. And in terms of my wife and I chasing the bears, we followed our intuition. But at the same time, it was an educated risk. I, I knew my front door was only 50 feet away. And I also knew that worst comes to worst, I can outrun Lori. You know, she's slower than me. I'll be okay. It's, it was an educated risk, you know? <laughs> I hope you've told that joke in front of her. <laughs> of course. Of course. Of course. I mean, I'm blessed to have her. Uh, absolutely. Well, I am blessed uh, to have you on the program. It's really a pleasure to talk to you about the myriad of things that we have that all do tie into Chase the Bears, plural, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, RickKeller.com is the website we encourage you to go to. We, uh, Rick, uh, and I stand corrected, that's RickKeller.net. RickKeller.net, and we'll be linked to the .net, okay? I don't know where the other one goes. We, we won't even bother. But we'll be linked to your website so people can find out more about you, the work you're doing, get a copy of your book as well, and find out more about you and accept you. Don't, you know what, folks? Don't tolerate Rick, okay? That's the <laughs> last thing we want is for you to tolerate Rick. We want you to accept him. 
and every one of our programmers, whether you agree with them or not, and I'm not asking you to, and I know Rick isn't asking you to agree with him. I mean, what kind of a world would it be if we all agreed on everything? That'd be Absolutely. Kind of, kind of boring, too. Uh, I think we could learn from each other. I, I've often thought about, especially with the folks who, folks who have died, whether it be in the military or COVID or whatever the cause is, and the lost potential of what they could have contributed to our society if they were here with us. And, and we hear about, for example, sadly, uh, some of these school shootings in particular, or some of these other mass shootings in other places, and they start telling you about the people who died and what they were doing and, and they were pursuing this and they were pursuing that and and i'm thinking oh my god what uh, and we lost this person oh we got we got to stop this uh, you know we got to find a way but by the same token part of this natural world you know is this birth and life and death and birth and life and death and and it goes on whether we go on and uh, uh, hopefully we can go on and make this a better place. And I'd like to think too, based upon what you've shared with us here, uh, Rick, uh, it sounds like you have. You have made this world a better place, even if it's just for a few through, especially that one bill you were talking about uh, of the, with the Pell Grants. Uh, you know, I mean, I think I, that's one of the ways that I, uh, I went to uh, junior college uh, back in <coughs> the 80s uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> was uh, using Pell Grants. So, well, I hope so. That my my only mission really is to, is to lift people up and bring them together. And if in some small way my my book can help someone, it can, it can help them achieve their dreams. It can help them connect with others. And I will be uh, amazingly happy. We're talking with Rick Keller about his book Chase the Bears on Tell Me Your Story. I'm Richard Dugan, your host, and Rick, I I can't thank you enough for your time here on the program. Uh, and your book as well, Chase the Bears. It's available through his website, which is, of course, rickkeller.net. Uh, little things to achieve big dreams. And uh, we hope you'll uh, go to his website and uh, Amazon. It is, by the way, folks, an Amazon uh, bestseller, number one bestseller. So we hope you'll get a copy of that. Rick, I have three final questions. I ask all of my guests. <laughs> sure. Okay? And uh, again, I thank you so much. Uh, the first of those three questions is, who is Rick Keller? Well, I think Rick Keller is uh, an optimistic guy who doesn't take himself that seriously and who just wants to lift other people up and give folks the same kind of chance that, that he had when he was growing up. What is your life's purpose? My life's purpose at this moment is to help other people get the trophies. I, I want to be a mentor, a teacher. I want to help lift others up. And I get so much more satisfaction now of, of helping other people achieve their dreams than I do of uh, setting other goals to myself. And so my, my purpose is really to, to, to lift people up and help them, help them achieve their dreams. And I, I kind of preface this third question because not everybody will get it, but I, I'm pretty sure you will. Uh, the movie reference uh, to this question. What was your best day? My best day would be the day I married my, my wife, Lori, uh, and uh, my soulmate and um, best day of my life and it's the best decision i've ever made i get more happiness out of it and i just uh feel very grateful that the universe brought us together rick keller again thank you so much we really do appreciate your time and we thank you for listening to and watching tell me your story new paradigms for a new world as we are giving you choices and knowledge of those choices to help make your dreams come true and until our next broadcast podcast video cast love to lol and Jeanette, I am listening.